So when I started uh, this, working this in, in uh, 1993, and in the year 2000, I was asked to uh, do some training um, through uh, Caledonian University in Glasgow, Scotland. And so I, that's when I started doing workshops, and I, I've been doing quite a few workshops a year um, since. And ever, ever since I started, um, I've always, if, as long as the group is large enough to warrant it, I start off by asking people if they think giving blood is a good idea, if blood donation is a good thing to do. And typically people, everybody in the audience puts up their hand to say, yes, it's a good idea. I've spoken to 300 people, over 300 people at a time, and everybody puts up their hand because people generally believe that blood donation is a good idea. So then I say, well, okay, uh, why? And I just point to people. It's a bit of an icebreaker at the beginning of, of a presentation or a workshop. I just point to people in the audience and say, well, why do you think blood donation is a good idea? And people can readily say why they think blood donation is a good idea. They say you can save lives. You might save your own life. It's a renewable resource and, and only takes a few minutes and it can save life, all of those sorts of things. So then I say, Okay, that's great. Everybody thinks it's a great idea and everybody knows why it's a great idea. Please put up your hand if you've given blood in the last uh, month and, and leave it up. And anybody last six months, last year, and I go back five years. And typically there's a small smattering of hands in the audience. And then I say to them, well, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. Um, now, when I always ask these questions, and everybody has the attitude that giving blood donation is really important, and everybody knows why. They, they're very aware of the benefits. However, in the U.S., only about 3.5% of, of Americans actually donate blood. And in Canada, it's about the same 3.5%. So, now, to be fair, I, I believe the number of, the percentage of eligible um, people that can, can donate is 38% in the States. It's about 50% in Canada, but still 38% of Americans could and only 3% do. So you have a gap there. You've got um, blood donation, uh, people believing that blood donation is really important and knowing all the benefits, but they're simply not doing it. So it's an example of the gap between having the right attitude and the right awareness and um, performing the behavior. So another example is doctors washing hands. Now doctors, and not just doctors, but uh, nurses and, and other healthcare professionals, they go to school for a long, long time in order to learn all about disease prevention, disease, curing diseases, medicine, all that, that kind of thing. And they're very, very aware that it's important to wash your hands when you go from one patient to another in order to try and stop the spread of communicable diseases um, and, and, and um, other, other concerns as well. Um, so, so I think, you know, more than anybody, um, that population, that subpopulation understands it. And I think it's fair to say that 100% of, of medical professionals would have the attitude that it's very important to wash their hands. And they'd be aware, 100% of them would be aware of all the reasons why it's very important to do it. However, in many different studies all across the world, where there's ob observational research has been done, it, it, it's sometimes as low as 12%. Um, this particular 12% number comes from a study that was done in in a number of uh, hospitals and medical care facilities in the Vancouver, uh, or sorry, in the Victoria um, uh, portion of British Columbia. But you, if you take a look and just Google doctors not washing hands or doctors washing hands, you'll find that there are stories in the US, um, there's stories in the UK, there's stories across Canada um, about the problem that healthcare professionals are trying to wrestle with is that uh, they just simply doctors and nurse and nurses and other healthcare um, uh, healthcare professionals are not being compliant with um, washing their hands. So the protocols that are that are you know that are important. So you know somehow for some reason oh I see okay. Um, 
so my point here is that there's a huge gap between attitude and awareness and people actually doing the behavior. Um, and it's such a, a, a big gap and it's so prominent that there's actually a name for the phenomenon. It's called the attitude behavior gap in psychology. So if you can accept this and understand it, then you realize that you can't just convince people that something is a good idea and then sit back and comfortably expect that the behavior will follow because it just simply doesn't. Um, nonetheless, I'm not saying that you can't, that you shouldn't convince people that something is important and convince them of the reasons why they should do it, but you can't stop there. You've got to um, work on the behavior as well. So this is what I'm going to talk about today in the time that we have together, is how do you uh, directly address the behavior to foster the behavior that you want to happen rather than, um, than just go with, go with trying to increase attitude and awareness. I don't know what the ads, television ads for blood donation are like in the States, but in Canada, they're very, very compelling. Um, they must have the best ad agencies working on these things. Um, you know, they, they tug at your heartstrings. They'll show a child that needs uh, a blood transfusion. Um, all kinds of different, really dire situations and say, you know, we need your help. Um, but the thing, thing is that there's no room for improvement in Canada in convincing people that they should give blood. And there's no room for improvement in uh, explaining to them why they should give blood. Everybody knows that. So a TV ad that just addresses those may grab your heartstrings, but it's not going to make a big impact on people um, who are not giving blood. You've got to go, you've got to take other steps. And we'll talk about those kinds of steps. So for the rest of the presentation, I'm hoping that you will agree with me that um, just having the right attitude and the right awareness are not enough uh, to um, ensure that the behavior will happen. So I'm going to talk a bit about uh, some work I've done with uh, the Invasive Species Council of British Columbia. I've been working with them for almost 10 years now, eight or nine years anyways, and uh, on several programs. Um, I've worked with them on their uh, Play Clean Go program for um, hikers and outdoor enthusiasts, clean, drain, dry. Uh, we're working on firewood now. Um, we've had a plant-wise program in place for horticulture um, for, I think, six or seven years. And uh, we have a Don't Let It Loose um, program as well. So um, I've enjoyed working with them, and, uh, and we're now um, taking a lot of that stuff nationally uh, across Canada. But I'm going to speak mostly, my examples today will mostly come from a, the Clean Drain Dry program. But everything's applicable to all invasive species. So the behavior change steps that I want to talk about today are uh, research, um, promoting behaviors, uh, securing commitments from people to, to do behaviors, to perform the behaviors that you want, uh, supporting them with reminders and developing a culture of uh, those behaviors. So I'll go through each of those um, elements and uh, rather quickly here. So first of all, uh, research. It's really important to identify um, what's happening now out in the field. If you're, if you're working on a clean drain and dry program, then you want to know um, how many or what people are doing? Are, are they clean draining, their, drying their boats? Do they have the knowledge and do they have the uh, awareness about the benefits and are they concerned about um, aquatic invasive species? So you do need to know that sort of thing. Um, that's best accomplished with surveys, um, but you can also do literature reviews um, that, that uh, are helpful because much of that kind of work has also been done in other jurisdictions, and there's a lot to be gained by finding out, uh, seeing what research has been done by, by others in different jurisdictions, at different uh, educational institutions. Um, there's a lot out there. Um, 
particularly for some pathways like uh, like AI, AIS pathways, um, like clean like our watercrafts and and bait using bait and uh, um, there's quite a bit on the aquarium trade. Um, other things like diving and um, you know moving um, moving docks and and uh, you know used boat trade and all of that. There's not so much on, but um, or hunting, but there are many of the pathways. There's a lot of research out there, so it's it's well worth either conduct, conducting a literature review to find out what what's been done elsewhere, what the best management practices are. Um, or looking for previous literature reviews that have already been done so you don't have to uh, um, reinvent the wheel by d doing a new literature review. Surveys are really good for, um, as I said, finding out what's going on, also developing a baseline so that when you apply your behavioral change approach, then you can measure later on um, to see if you've, if you've made some impact. Um, but surveys, I'll talk about barriers in a moment, but uh, surveys can also determine what's preventing people, well-intentioned people, from performing the behaviors that you want, and what motivates people, for those who are doing it, what mo what's the motivator that's getting them to do it? Because you may be able to push that motivator with somebody else and convince them to do it. Um, focus groups are really good for um, drilling down and talking to people, you know, for instance, a uh, focus group of people who are often moving their boats from one uh, body of water to another, if you sat them down and talked to them about why, I, I, what I would do is I'd have a group that are clean draining and drying their boats and another one that are not clean draining and drying their boats and have different questions. I'd want to find out why the people who are doing it are doing it, what makes them do it. Um, for those people who aren't, I'd want to talk to them more about um, why they're not and what it would take to get them to do it. Um, so focus groups are, are really good, but they're not statistically significant like surveys are. So you can't, um, you can't extrapolate to an entire population from focus groups. Observation is really, really good though. You, to, to be able to either sit there and at a landing and record how many people are actually clean draining and drying their boats um, or putting a camera up and then checking the tape later on, um, that that's really good because you, you're actually you're seeing the actual uh, uh, behaviors and not just reported behaviors. Remove some of the bias that people have, the social bias, where if you ask them if they um, are, do the right thing, people tend to say yes, even if they're not. But the important thing is to do what you can with the budget that's available. I've worked with NGOs that have essentially no money and you do the best you can. Um, if you've got a big budget, then you want you probably want to do all of those things. But uh, it's better to take action and try and prevent it, um, and even if you have uh, a very small budget. So um, some people would say that you wouldn't go ahead even with a program at all unless you did all that research. I disagree. I think it's important to take action. Um, you do as much research as you can with the budget and time available. So um, barriers and benefits identification is really important, an important part of the research. So as I said, you know, you still want to be checking with for awareness and attitude. So do people know about aquatic invasive species and the risks um, associated with it? Um, you can imagine just going back to the blood donation thing. It's, it would be easier to get people to adopt the behavior if they already knew that it, and felt that it was a good thing to do and knew all the benefits. If they didn't know anything about blood donation, didn't know the benefits, and you just stopped them and said, hey, listen, do you mind if you come into this building, lie down on a bed, and we're going to stick a needle in your arm and suck a pint of blood out of you? People are unlikely to actually do it without knowing the reasons why they should. So you, we do need to know. We, we do need to measure the awareness and attitude that people have, but we just can't stop um, with uh, when they do have that awareness and attitude. If the awareness and attitude is really low, then we do have to try and shore it up or, or increase it um, through our communications campaigns. So with, uh, for barriers and benefits, we want to know why aren't people cleaning, draining, and drying their boats? Perhaps they feel that... Uh, 
there's no reason to. Um, it, it may be very valid reasons is that they always have their boat in the same water like I do with mine. I, mine's in the ocean, but it's, uh, um, it's, I don't move it around to different places. So I don't tend to clean, drain, and dry it when I take it out at the end of – I do clean it I don't, uh, and I drain it, but I don't dry it when I take it out at the end of the season. And for people who aren't moving from one body of water to another, they, that might be a reason they're not doing it. But particularly for those who are going from one body of water to another, we need to know why they aren't doing it. Is it because they don't have the equipment or they don't know how to do it? Um, they don't think it's important. Uh, they don't have the time at the landing because it's the landing's always busy. Um, so we need, we need to find out those barriers and we cannot assume them. We, uh, often when we work in programs, I've worked in recycling programs, all kinds of different ones. There's uh, when you're an, ex an expert because you're working in these things, you know, it's easy to assume that you know um, what everybody is thinking out there and what the barriers might be. That's a mistake. I've done research for 25 years in different programs, and I can tell you that every time I do a survey and do research, I learn something new that I didn't know before. So you don't want to make assumptions. You need to know, determine the actual barriers. And then you have to remove them. And I'll talk about removing them in a second. But I also want to say that it's a, the, the perceived benefits um, are very important too. Um, we need to know why people are doing uh, the, um, taking the appropriate actions. Um, because if we know what motivates them, then we can push that in our communications and when we're talking to people and, um, and in the hope that those um, motivators will motivate other people to do it as well. So anyways, if I, when I'm doing a one or two day workshop, I spend a lot more time on research, but when I'm talking for an hour, I do it pretty briefly and that's it. The, the one thing I just need to say is do the research you can with the budget that's available to you. So, so the next step though, after determining barriers of why aren't people taking that action is to remove the barriers. So, if you've got, if um, people tend to do things that are easiest or convenience, so you want to increase the convenience of doing things. So if you have, if you're asking people to clean, drain, and dry their boats, use a pressure washer to to um, clean the hull, pick uh, um, any anything they can see off the trailer or the boat uh, on the outside to drain it and to dry it and all of that. Um, you know, you will have more people doing it the more convenient it is. Um, that may mean having pressure washers and uh, hot water available and that kind of thing at the landing um, where that's practical. But if you can remove some of those barriers so that people can do it, it's um, you'll get more people doing it. And if you can make it really easy, then there's hardly any reason not to. So if you take a look at this picture, this is from uh, a project we did in Lake Simcoe in Ontario. And we had the, um, we had pressure washers right there. Now it was a portable one, so it's not there for anybody to use at any time, but this was a, a program where we, it was a pilot project that we did. And here we have one of our um, project people showing these fishermen how to pressure wash their boat and get uh, anything off it. Now, Lake Simcoe has a ton of invasive species. So they're, they're encouraging people to clean, drain and dry as they come out of Lake Simcoe um, because they don't want, we don't want to see the spread from Lake Simcoe of these invasive species to other lakes and rivers. Um, so this is, uh, this guy was showing the, the, these two fellows how to do it. Later on, he, after showing them, he uh, sought a commitment from them to do it themselves at other times. And I'll talk about that a bit later. But, but it's so important to remove the barriers um, to the adoption of the behavior. It's probably the most important thing to do. Just as an example, um, from a different um, a, a different issue. Um, I used to do a lot of, of work in recycling when it was first started in the late 80s. And in recycling, 
um, many municipalities started curbside programs and other municipalities worried about the cost of curbside collection um, would only put depots up and where you had to drive your recycling to uh, um, to depots and drop the stuff off there. I recall um, being down in Florida and seeing that that's what people had to do, whereas back at home in Canada where I lived, um, you had curbside collection of recyclables. Um, so we, we used to see a lot of programs like that. The fact was that when you measured it, the depot collection, because it was uh, relatively inconvenient, didn't receive nearly amount, the same amount of material as uh, um, those with curbside collection. So, okay, so we've uh, done our research, we've identified the, the barriers, and we've established a baseline that we can measure against. Then we want to promote those behaviors that we, we want to uh, people to undertake. So, you know, here's a clean drain dry um, graphic from uh, British Columbia. And naturally, if you want people to do these things, then you've got to uh, tell them exactly what it is that you want them to do. Uh, what does cleaning entail? What does draining in entail? And what does drying entail? Um, so, I guess my, my main point is just to reiterate that I'm not saying don't tell people what they have to do. Um, you, you, you don't just work on the behavior. You still got to work on the knowledge and make it very clear what it is that they want to do. If it, you'll find that you'll often find that when you ask people, why aren't you cleaning, draining and drying your boats? They say, they just say, I don't know what to do. So, or somebody might know that draining, they can drain their motor by putting it back down um, after pulling it up off the ramp and the water will, will run out and that's great and then they can put it back up but they might not know at all about live wells and and uh, um, bait buckets um, they may be used to removing their drain plug or or um, draining their bilge um, but if they don't understand all of it then they're not doing a, the proper job so so you you want to then promote promote the behaviors um, and then you want to ask people to get, uh, you want to get people to commit to performing those behaviors. So what we typically do is uh, we have a, uh, take an approach, um, you can, for instance, at a landing you know, where that fellow was um, helping these two gentlemen, these two fishers and getting them, helping them to uh, clean their boat, showing them how they can do it. And at the end of that, um, that display he would say all right now you know how to uh, clean drain and dry your boat and he would have been telling them why and if there's anything he could point out that had to be removed and that sort of thing he would have been explaining that to them and at the end of it he would say okay you've seen how to do it um can we count on you clean draining and drying your boat um from now on and typically people will say yes if, if you've removed the barriers if they if they don't if, if they don't say yes, then you say, well, why not? Maybe the person will say, well, I don't have a pressure washer. Um, and usually when I come out of this um, area here, it, or I come out of this landing, there isn't a, a uh, pressure washer. This is just a uh, one that's here today. And so then you have to try and break down those barriers. So you, you may say, well, do you have a pressure washer at home? Or can you even just wash what you can off with a, a hose and, 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 uh, remove any visible material, that sort of thing. And if they say yes to that, they say, okay, well, that's great. Is there any, re any other reason why you might not do it? Maybe the person says, well, it's, you know, this is a busy landing. I'm here a lot. It's busy. I don't want to be in the way of people. Um, uh, so I, I try and get into my truck and get off, uh, get away again, away very quickly. And then you might say, well, okay, but would you be able to, would you be willing to just pull over um, before you hit, hit the road, hit the road, or when, or when you get home, and make sure that you spread this stuff before, or, or you, you clean, drain, and dry, so you don't spread this stuff before going in, and and get them to say yes. And essentially, what you're doing is breaking down all their barriers in in a uh, uh, in a, a nice converse, conversation um, until the point where you say, okay, so now can we count on you doing it? And they ha they've run out of excuses, and they say yes. So 
um, why I typically for our clients will write up a script um, that people can go through and when they're talking to people and if they throw up this barrier then you know say this and that kind of thing so when they say yes and this is an important element of, of behavioral psychology um, if you say yes that you will do something not only have you made sort of made a promise to them but uh, subconsciously you change your own self-perception so you say okay I'm going to do this you changed yourself your own uh, perception of yourself to to that of, of someone who cleans drains and dries their boats or someone who takes actions to protect our lakes and rivers against aquatic invasive species or um, if it's in, in other things it, um, it might be I take I take uh, action to conserve water so I don't run my sprinkler on the lawn when it's raining uh, I don't I turn down my thermostat at night because I'm a person who reduces energy consumption conserves energy whatever it might be um, so that self-perception thing is very very important and it's something that we don't get if we're just putting out brochures telling people what they should be doing and explaining why because we don't have an op opportunity for them to say yes I'm going to do this and that makes one heck of a big difference so changing that self-perception is is really important um, and that's why we seek commitments to performing the behavior so that's the first real difference between typical um, uh, uh, promotion campaigns um, and uh, and using behavior change programs so when you're obtaining commitments now here's those same two gentlemen and it's the same guy that was pressure washing, showing them how to pressure wash the boat. I don't know about you, but I, whenever I look at this picture, I look at those two fellows there and I think those aren't the kinds of guys that you would expect that are going to make a commitment to, uh, um, to, to clean their boat, to clean, drain, and dry their boats. But they have, and what that fellow with the uh, Rapala hat is doing is signing a written commitment. So... We call, I call this climbing the ladder of commitments, but when you talk to somebody and you say, okay, will you clean, drain, and dry your boat? And the person says, yes. We know that that's powerful. That verbal commitment is powerful, but stronger yet is a written commitment. So we typically would have a clipboard like this and we would have, it, it, it's much like a petition. And we say, that's great. Um, we're keeping a list of all of the people who are committed to clean draining and drying their boats in order to uh, stop invasive species. Can you add your name to the list? And of course, the, you know, not everybody will, but uh, most people will. They've just said they're going to do it. So why wouldn't you add your name to the list? That written commitment has proven through research to be much stronger than a verbal commitment. So we always seek a written commitment. Then typically what we do is we'll have a little checkbox beside there. So right after that fellow signs his name, we say, this is great, thanks so much. We're trying to keep track of how many commitments that we have. Um, we've got perhaps something on a website or we've got, uh, uh, we're, we have a newsletter and we're, and we're, we're um, publishing the initials of those people who, um, you know, names, initials, whatever, you know, it, it depends on, on privacy requirements. Um, but something to show that they have made that commitment. Do you mind if we, um, if we publish your commitment? And when they check that box off, again, not everybody will, but most people will, they've now made a, a public commitment. And a public commitment is much stronger than a written commitment, which is much stronger than a verbal commitment. So we always try and climb that ladder of, of uh, commitment to get a strong commitment commitment as possible and and we do this every single time um all uh, one thing about commitments i when i'm working on these programs my own little uh, image of what i'm trying to do is i say that um anybody that comes within 10 feet of me is going to be in, asked for a commitment i don't i don't talk to anybody about it without asking them for a commitment at the end of it um, and 10 feet might be uh, longer than that if it's over the telephone line. But if I'm talking to somebody, I'm, I'm not going to finish the conversation without say, at least saying, okay, well, can we count on you giving it a try? Because it's so powerful. Now, the, now one thing I, I need to tell you about this, though, is 
I have run into a lot of situations um, where we had the wrong people in the field. We had people who, you know, bless their hearts, they were very passionate about it. They were, they worked hard. They talked to people and all of that, but they just didn't have it in them to say, to ask for that commitment to say, well, can we count on you um, giving it a try then? They were, they, um, I don't know if it was, they felt awkward about it, if they were timid. Um, but you do want to, if you're going to be um, putting a program in place like this and have people in the field asking for commitments, you need to know, you have to train them and you have to make sure that it's really, they understand how important it is to the success of the program. And they, and you really have to know that they are going to um, ask for that commit, commitment because if they're too shy to, then really all you've, all you've got is a more expensive um, traditional communications campaign. So you have to ask, have them ask for that commitment. So this is um, from the uh, uh, website uh, from the Invasive Species Council of British Columbia. And, and sometimes, you know, you just don't have the resources to ask for commitments all the time. Or you want to ga gather, you might not see everybody. If you, you can go and spend the summer at, uh, um, at a boat landing and you're not going to see everybody. So you can do online commitments. They're not uh, quite as effective as a face-to-face -face one. But uh, this is an example. You can see this is a clean drain and dry um, page on their website. And here's a commitment form. So it says to do my part in stopping, I commit to do my part, as part in stopping the spread of aquatic invasive species and beyond I'll clean drain and dry my boat put name and email they're, they're grabbing the email address so that they can then uh, um, send them more information if they want permission to publish first name last initial on ISCBC website yes so there you've got you've you've uh, got a written written commitment and if they say yes you've turned it into a, a public commitment which is much stronger and then they have a request for um, if they want to become a member of the ISCBC. So commitments can take uh, different forms, but you really have to um, pursue them. So the next thing after you've made commitments is providing reminders. Now this, you know, we, typically when I, when I do programs like this, um, people will say, well, of course we provide reminders. Um, we put signs up and that sort of thing. But reminders are really important. Um, because they support the commitments that you have, uh, that people have just made. So they made a commitment, now try and help them uh, to remember. So such things as uh, little signs, you may have them in your own offices, last one turns out, turns off the coffee pot or turns out, out the lights. Um, those are really important. But it's also very important to uh, put them in very close in time and space to where the behavior is to be done. Just uh, the week before last, I was on a national um, call on a clean drain dry um, program, a working group program, sorry, clean drain dry program working group. And I was talking about prompts and I was saying, well, you know, we might want to have stickers for um, windshields of boats that say, you know, I clean, drain, and dry. Um, that's a public commitment. I clean, drain, dry my boat or a bumper sticker for a trailer or something like that. And one of the people on there said, well, people don't want to put stickers on their boats. And, and I've run into that. I, you know, that's a fair criticism. But she said, um, instead, let's get magnets that people can put on their fridge. Well, Having a magnet on your fridge does not remind you to clean, drain, and dry your boat at the landing. Um, it's, and, and people are going to forget about it. Um, what we need is reminders in, close in time and space. So you can imagine if you've got a coffee pot in the back of your office, um, putting a sign beside the coffee pot says last one out turns off the coffee pot is not going to help. You want that sign at the door when somebody is going out the door. Um, and they see it and they go, oh yeah, I'm the last one here. I better go back and turn off that coffee pot. Uh, same thing with lights. You don't put the sign at the light switch. If the light switch isn't at the door, you put it at the door um, because it's about going out and that's where the action is. So you say, let's turn out, let's last one out turns off. It turns out the lights and you put that at the door where people are exiting. Um, 
an example, one, a blunder I made one time is I was approached by the Yellow Pages company to put all the recycling information for my hometown, Halifax, into the Yellow Pages. And I thought, oh, and they said they'd do it for free. And uh, I said, oh, okay, that's great. Um, but who looks up the Yellow Pages for, in the Yellow Pages for uh, recycling information? In fact, we did focus groups a few years later and I asked and not a single person uh, knew that it was even in there. So because it's not in the place where you want it. For recycling, you want it in the kitchen or in the garage or wherever you might be doing some recycling or put it right, the information right on your recycling bin. So prompts are simple and effective. They're, you know, they're just reminders. They can be little signs. Um, they can be a whole bunch of different things, but they need to be where you want to do it, like this one in BC. This sign is right at the landing. It reminds people. It says, attention voters. Now, we're, we're in the process of developing new signs right now, but um, it tells you exactly what to do. It's got that graphic that I showed you before, or, or one, near, one close to it, with the clean, drain, and dry, and the text that says what to do. It has that graphic that you see in a lot of uh, clean, drain, dry programs, with showing the boat on the bottom with um, the different places to look. Um, but it's right at the landing. So we're not relying on the person seeing a sign on a highway or, or seeing an ad on TV or um, um, re remembering a brochure that they saw at a boat show or something like that. It's right there where, where they're going to do the action. We're reminding them what to do. Um, you may see may have seen these things off it. Our, our company uh, developed Idle Free Zone um, signage and, and uh, graphics and pr programs based on behavior change for the Canadian government uh, 15 years ago or so, 20 years ago probably. Um, you may have seen some of this stuff, these exact same graphics uh, in use in the United States because I know it's been implemented a lot in the United States. Um, but uh, you want to put that information right there in an idle free zone at a school or a hospital or wherever people might be idling. Um, their vehicles, and uh, not just rely on some brochure that was delivered to their home. And, uh, you know, those these turn off the lights programs, they can be very, very simple. And, and or, sorry, prompts and reminders can be very, very simple, but they're very effective if they're used in the right place. And more and more, what I'm uh, looking at and trying to implement is um, uh, apps. Because you can have an app that will remind you to do things at certain times. It, they can also, uh, you can set them up for proximity. Um, so you can have a, a reminder that when you go get to the marina or the landing um, to do certain things, your phone will buzz in your pocket and it, remind, it reminds you to, uh, to take proper actions. Um, and we don't need to, you know, typically this actually came up this week as somebody who said, yeah, well, Geez, I don't know if we can want to go take the time and the money to to uh, write an app for this stuff. And I say, you don't need to. There's all kinds of reminder apps that everybody has. Um, you just need to uh, get them to use it. So um, the fact that we have these supercomputers in our pockets, and we call them phones, but hardly ever call anybody on them, we can use them for more um, for other utility um, purposes like uh, reminders to to uh, take proper behaviors, or proper actions rather. So other reminders like floating keychains. Um, the fact, if you've got a keychain, we've, we've used them uh, here. I know a lot of people have used them, but if they're on the, uh, if your keys for your boat are on your floating keychain, on a floating keychain, it's dangling there every time you start, stop your boat. If that's the kind of boat that you have, you've got it right in your hand, it's a good reminder. Um, stickers for windshield or bumper sticker for a trailer. Um, I do recognize that the trailers go in the water, so it's hard to a bumper sticker doesn't work that well. And people are reluctant to put stickers on on their boats. Um, perhaps they're okay with the vinyl cling ones on windshields, but uh, it's important that when you do have those kinds of reminders that are visible like that, it's another form of a public commitment that when, if somebody is willing to put a sticker on their windshield, no matter how small it might be, and it just says, I clean, drain, and dry my boat, it, it, it's a, a reminder to them when they see it, but it's also a public commitment that helps make that commitment stronger. It also, what I like about th that approach is it helps to create a social norm because when other people see those stickers, 
and they see more of them, then they're going to be encouraged. They're going to feel some peer pressure to do the same thing. I'll talk a bit more about social norms uh, um, quite soon here, but um, those are those reminders are go above and beyond just reminding the person. They also um, encourage other people to do it. But again, the, the reminders have to be in the sa uh, same place and time as the behavior should be done. Okay, so finally, I want to talk a bit about developing a culture. Um, if you've read Malcolm Gladwell's The Tipping Point, um, what he talks about is that, you know, you get a small um, number of people starting to do something and taking on a new um, set of behaviors, and then more people do it and more people do it. And once you get sort of over 50%, you've reached a tipping point where um, other people will start doing it that haven't done it before. So there's a, a um, I sometimes put this, this slide up and haven't here, I haven't included in this deck, but I often talk about uh, the curve where it's a bell curve and at the, on the left-hand side of the curve, curve rather, you've got about 15% of people who are early adopters and for anything new, um, that they, you'll get about 15% people will adopt it right away. Um, Apple uh, people are, and I am an Apple person, Apple people are the same sort of thing. As soon as Apple announces something, um, Apple people go out and buy it. So they're early adopters. The next ones are a little bit of laggards where they'll, uh, they don't do it right away, but when they see other people doing it, they, they tend to do it. And then you get over the top of the bell curve and you've reached 50%. And because it's now become a culture, more people are doing it because they feel the pressure to do it. You can imagine that if you're at a boat landing and everybody or almost everybody that's going in and out, every time that you're there stops and uses a pressure washer that's there, you'd feel very compelled to do the same thing. So we, we try and develop a culture. Um, there's many different cultures that have been formed. Uh, you know, when I was... Uh, first learning how to drive, there were no seat belts in the car that I was driving. Um, then seat belts um, became, were, were in cars, but there were no laws that required them. And then later on, there were law, laws. Now, my dad used to, when I was driving, he would take the, uh, the shoulder strap for the uh, seat belt, and he would just hook it over his shoulder and, and have his thumb there, and he wouldn't buckle it for some bloody reason. I don't know why. But... Um, it was just because it, it, the culture had been not to wear a seatbelt. It's very difficult to change from one culture to another. So he was struggling with moving from the culture where people didn't wear seatbelts to uh, one where they did. Um, so developing a culture is, is, a, is a big part of a successful widespread program. And I'll show you some examples. So here's one. Um, in North America, people tend to, when they're in an elevator, all turn around. They walk in, turn around, and face the front and, and face the door. Um, and that's what these people are doing here. You can see that none of them are looking at each other. Um, they're just uh, look, staring straight ahead, or sometimes they might look down and stare at their shoes, or they watch the numbers go up, um, as, uh, up or down. But they stare, they, everybody turns around and stares at the door. That's very much a social norm in North America. Now, interestingly, when I talk about this in the UK, they look at me like I have two heads because uh, they don't do that there. They, they, they stand in there and talk to people or whatever. But uh, generally, this is what's done in North America. So that's a cultural norm. And if the guy on the front right turned around and just – and look to the back of the elevator, I'm sure everyone would be uncomfortable because he would be breaking the social norm. Um, another example is, um, you know, when I was a kid, we learned to cough in our, into our fist. You put your fist in front of your mouth uh, to suppress a cough so that you didn't spread it around to everybody else. But it, it was only recently that people I guess realize that coughing into your hand and then shaking hands and touching things that other people are going to touch is a um, good way to spread um, spread colds and disease. So they turn to uh, coughing into your uh, elbow. Um, my kids cough into their elbow now. They they learn that all through their life. It took me a while to get used to it because often a cough comes on you really quickly and you go to what you're used to. Um, but uh, that was a, that's a, there was a social norm of everybody coughing 
into their fist, and now the social norm is to cough into your um, um, into your elbow. So when you put a sign up like this, um, and you put it up at the landing, here's uh, these guys have just installed this thing, and you can see how big the sign is. Um, that provides a social norm. Um, it, it's a reminder, but it's also um, provide some peer pressure for people to do it. It's a lot more difficult to take your boat out of that slip that's right there um, and not clean, drain, and dry your boat when there's a sign right there, and particularly when there's other people observing you. So, so these um, elements like this, which is, which is also a reminder, um, they can also help in developing the social norm. Um, and, you know, there's... Sometimes when we work on programs like this, and clean, drain, dry can be a difficult one um, because there may not be uh, um, the equipment necessary. Um, people can, uh, I guess, be, they might um, not be, may not have the confidence that they're going to be able to change behaviors. Uh, just incidentally, I'm just starting on Monday. Um, I've got, I applied for a program with Dalhousie universities with engineering students. They have a capstone pro um, project that they call it, that all of the um, students have to go through this project or do, have a capstone project where they try and innovate to um, resolve an issue. And uh, I asked them, I applied to it and said, um, you know, with clean, drain, and dry, we have a problem in that there's often not the equipment available at landings in order to actually properly clean, drain, and dry your boat. Um, pressure washers and hot water and that kind of thing, which we which we'd like to have, may not be there. And you know, it might it's it's difficult to have that there and expensive and that sort of thing. And I've asked them to try and come up or I asked if I could have uh, some students work on it to try and come up with an affordable, reasonable, very easy solution. In fact, I, I said, you know, something like those solar lights that, that have been developed in the third world for, uh, that are illuminating huts that were, that were always dark before. Something so simple. Maybe it's not equipment that's right there at the landing, but maybe it's something that can be in the boat that just like having an anchor, you'd also have this kind of thing. Maybe it's, gathering the heat from the um, water system that's cooling the motor, maybe you can grab that heat and use it to heat some water that's going to, you can spray into the bilge at the end or whatever. I, I, don't, I don't know what it is. I'm not an engineer, but anyways, fortunately um, I've been successful and we're kicking off that project on Monday and I'm hopeful that we're going to find a, a, a very simple but effective solution that we can uh, deploy more readily in landings uh, across North America. Um, but anyways, uh, my point is though that when you do need to, I just want to go back to the bar the removing barriers thing again and making things convenient because you may think that this is what you're going to try and do is very difficult, but there are were times when people thought that people were very unlikely to pick up a bag and grab a big hunk of dog poop. You know, if you, when, when it looks like it's really difficult, I think if you can conv convince people to walk around with bags of dog poop, that you can pretty well accomplish uh, anything in behavior change. So, uh, um, you know, keep a stiff upper lip.